Today let's talk about testing in this time of coronavirus. I like to say it that way instead of in this time of the coronavirus because it reminds me, well, let me take this damn thing off. It reminds me of Gabriel Garcia Marquez's book, Love in the Time of Cholera. So today we're gonna to talk about testing and specifically COVID-19 testing because obviously it's in the news almost every day. And you may say, what does this have to do with cancer? Well, the issues that arise are the same for pretty much any kind of medical testing. Things like false positives, false negatives, and so forth. And so I'm gonna be showing you a simple graph, how we sort these things out uh, when you have a group of, say, a thousand patients, maybe 50 of those patients have whatever the disease is, in this case, COVID-19. But it could also be testing for something like um, the HER2 uh, hormone receptor uh, in breast cancer patients. Uh, the issues are the same. So let's say you go in for some kind of medical test, uh, in this case, COVID-19. Uh, is the test perfect? No, it's never perfect. Uh, there is no perfect test out there. Uh, there typically is a test for a particular disease or condition that they're testing for called the gold standard. The gold standard tends to be a test that might take uh, a couple of days, maybe a week. Uh, it often involves a fair amount of expense. Maybe just doing testing one person costs $1,000. It often has to be done in a highly specialized laboratory or with very specialized techniques. And uh, that all means that it's expensive and slow. And of course, with testing, especially in an infectious disease situation like COVID-19, you don't want things to be slow and expensive. You gotta test millions of people and you wanna test them quickly. A test isn't very good if you test a person and you can only tell him four days later that he has a highly infectious disease because by then he spread it all over the place, right? So you want a test that comes back in 15 minutes while the patient's still in the office and says, hey, you got this thing, you gotta go home and self-isolate or whatever else you know, advice you would give or medical suggestions you would give based on the results of the test. But a fast test, a course is always better than a really slow test. A cheap test is better than an expensive test. A test that anyone can do, making it very convenient, like an at-home pregnancy test, is better yet. Then you don't even need a doctor. You just go in to your local neighborhood pharmacy and you buy a test kit, you bring it home, you test yourself. Now, of course, you wouldn't consider that a gold standard, especially uh, you know, if you're talking about pregnancy, uh, either you're happy about the pregnancy or maybe you're not happy about the pregnancy, uh, you probably want to get a, let's call it a second opinion. The second opinion in this case would be you go out and you buy another test kit and you double check. You had take a second test, uh, thinking that uh, two tests in a row showing me uh, positive or negative are likely to be um, a, be a better test situation, let's call it more accurate, although I have to be careful using that word because that has a spe special meaning in terms of medical testing. But let's use it as a general concept that people talk about, how accurate is the test. And you would be right to do that, to do two tests in a row, preferably with different kinds of test kits. So you're getting two different methods uh, testing the same thing, sort of to a check on each other. Uh, why would a test be bad? Why would it give you an incorrect result? Uh, well, maybe you brought home the pregnancy kit, you left it in your shower for two years, you kind of forgot about it, then all of a sudden you needed it, you thought you might be pregnant, you go ahead, you test. Well, the th problem is, just uh, because of the time lapse, who knows, uh, you know, generally speaking, these tests are pretty robust, these test kits, but they could deteriorate over time, so that's one thing. Uh, or maybe the, test, the testing method is known to degrade quickly in high heat and humidity, and you've mistakenly kept it in, a, in the shower where high heat and hum humidity are the norms. So uh, maybe something has affected the test and when you first test it, let's say you're positive, uh, you test positive, 
And then you go out and you buy another test kit, maybe buy a different type of test kit, as I mentioned. You go home and you test again, and you're positive again. So now you're probably uh, pretty likely to feel sure that you, in fact, are positive now. At that point, you'd go into the doctor, and the doctor may do the gold standard of testing, which involves more time and expense. Uh, but in the end, you get a, uh, an even better result, a, a, a result you can be even more confident in. So let's look at the major problems in testing, false positives and false negatives. And the reason I bring this up, by the way, is because, and I'm showing you on the screen here, uh, yesterday in the news there was a story about the Abbott Labs rapid test kit that Trump touted, and that's a good word to use for it, like a common carnival barker, Trump touted this particular test kit. It turns out that the test kit uh, has a 48% false negative rate. A false negative is where a person actually has COVID-19, but when you test them 48 times out of 100, the test comes back saying they don't have COVID-19, even though they do. And so, of course, this is a big problem. Let's start with a simple calculation for false positive testing in a home pregnancy test. And let's assume that about 2% of those tests that you do turn out to be false positives. That means the test shows that you're pregnant when you're really not, okay, 2% of the time. But if you do the test two times in a row, uh, then you have this situation. The first test is 2% or in decimals 0.02. But then the second test is also 0.02. Maybe it's a different test kit, but it has the same number for false positives, uh, which is 2 out of 100, roughly. We multiply those together when we do two tests in a row. We get 0.0004 which is 0.04%. That's tiny. In other words, the chance that you get a false positive when you test positive twice in a row goes from two chances out of 100 to two chances out of 5,000 because 0.0004 is four out of 10,000, which we simplify to two out of 5,000. So two out of 100, eh, you could still think maybe that's wrong the test. But two out of 5,000, it's pretty unlikely. That's, uh, you know, a false, po or uh, yeah, that it's a false positive. Now let's look at a test for COVID-19. Let's say you have a thousand patients who are being tested. And in reality, if you uh, somehow could magically know for sure, there are 950 of those thousand are healthy and only 50 are sick, which is roughly the figure for COVID-19 because about 5% of people tested turn out to be sick. Okay, so what happens? <clears throat> well, in the sick patients, 50 sick, sick patients, uh, maybe the testing not being perfect finds that 48 people test positive. In other words, you get a correct positive result in 48 out of the 50 people and you get a false negative in two people. Uh, so that's what we call a false negative because you actually want to find these people who are sick, but two times out of 50, you make a mistake. Then on the other end, we have the false positives. That's when you have healthy people and you test them. Now there are, of course, generally speaking, a lot more healthy people than there are sick people. So let's say we have 920 people test negative, and in fact, that's a correct result because they're healthy. And then that relieves 30 people remaining, and those people are false positives. They're actually healthy, but they were tested and found to be positive for whatever the thing is, say COVID-19. So now let's look at the numbers on that. So let's talk about sensitivity first. That refers to uh, how good your test is when you have sick people and when you test them, you actually show that they're positive. In our case, 48 out of 50 people were sick uh, and were and tested positive. So that's uh, 
a figure of 0.96 or 96 percent is the sensitivity. The next uh, measure called specificity deals with the bottom half there, false positives and correct negative results. And so let's do that calculation. So here we have specificity. We had 920 people who were correctly identified by the test as being negative out of the 950 people who were actually negative. And that gives us this figure, 0.97 and so forth. Uh, this math symbol here means approximately equal to 98%. So in this case, we have a sensitivity of 96% and a specificity of 98%. You might ask, what's more important, sensitivity or specificity? And that really depends on the particulars of the medical situation. So sometimes you want a high sensitivity, and other times you want a high specificity. Or, you know, you're usually trying to balance one versus the other. So it's generally a kind of a trade-off. As you increase sensitivity, you may decrease specificity and vice versa.